So our three panelists this morning have a lot to say, and I have some things to say in commentary on them. And so in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend any time doing what you can do on Google. So I'm not going to actually introduce them except to uh, say that the speakers will be in, in backwards order. Uh, Katarina Pistor from Columbia Law School, uh, Jamim uh, Mudud from uh, Sarah Lawrence, and Anush Kapadia. Uh, and so Anush will start, and then, uh, then Jamie, we're going to sit over on the side while you use your, the, uh, the presentations, and then I'll comment a little bit. And we should have, as long as everyone sticks to time, we should have time for you to participate as well in the discussion. So uh, you can show us time. Uh, I can show you time if you like. Yeah. That'll be good. That'll be OK, good. Yeah. thank good. you. So uh, each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes. Um, Anush, please. Um, so good morning. Uh, my name is Anush Kapadi. I work in, I'm the guy from Bombay, um, <laughs> who's, who Chris mentioned. First of all, I think we should just, uh, since I'm starting off here, um, maybe we should just give Chris a big round of applause for, for putting this all together. Um, uh, and it's, you know, it's um, an amazing conference, and I'll do my best to get out of the way quickly so we can get on to the good stuff. Um, but I have a, this, this paper is part of uh, a broader project that I'm calling the, sorry, I can't see the presentation over here and there at the same time. Now I put something off. Okay, um, I won't go there then. Um, it's part of a broader project um, that I'm calling a political theory of money that I'm trying to distinguish from the state theory of money. Um, and it's this part of it is uh, this, the chapter that I gave uh, Roy and, and the panel is a kind of humanistic exercise, a kind of close reading of Jeffrey Ingham's The Nature of Money, um, and trying to situate myself vis-a-vis um, -vis Ingham's very historically and theoretically rich reading of The Nature of Money. Um, and I won't, uh, for, for reasons of time, get into that kind of exegetical um, exercise. Um, but it is animated by this question, why does the state have the best money? And I'm kind of trying to situate myself between these two schools of thought, which are, I'm, I'm using chart lists for, an ex you know, you can think of MMT, you can think of neo-chartalism. I'm just using chartalism as a kind of Randy Ray, Jeffrey Ingham, that school of thought. Um, and their answer to the question, why does the state have the best money, is pretty straightforward. The state is a sovereign. And the sovereign has the power of fiat. The sovereign has sovereign power. And state debt, little IOUs, uh, they, they've moved on from classical chartalism. They no longer think it's a token. They agree that state, that money is a form of debt. But it's sort of like credit by fiat, because there's never really any question that the state's debt will be accepted. Um, because taxes drive money, taxes, uh, uh, liabilities on all of us generate the demand for the state's IRU. And so there's never really a problem of acceptabilities. And that's why the state has the best money. The banking school has a, has a more commercial um, bent to it. Um, and they, uh, they are of the view that there is a commercial cal calculation involved, uh, that, that the state's debt is calculated as being risk-free. And it's it's not so much fiat, but a kind of commercial deal that, that uh, renders the state's money as the best money. And, the, and that's because the, spa the state is kind of a special bank. It's, it's, it, it's uniquely able to do the banking business. Um, it's not so special, though. There are other people who can do this banking business, and certainly not all states are on the same plane. Some states can do the banking business better than others, but it's more, uh, there's a commercial logic embedded in there. And I want to take issue a little bit with both these schools um, and say that, on the one hand, Yes, the chartless are right, of course, the state is a sovereign, but I'm not convinced that they have an adequate account of what sovereignty is. And they reduce sovereignty, in a sense, to a monopoly on coercion, monopoly on authority, and um, they don't, it's, it's a sort of thin reading of sovereignty. Um, and, we'll, uh, and I'll go into what a, one can have a kind of slightly more richer reading of sovereignty, and that gives us, I think, something, gets us to a different reason as to why the state has uh, the best money, in particular, they are big fans of Minsky, but they don't really deal with Minsky's survival constraint. Um, and I want to say that the survival constraint, namely the requirement for liquid funds, binds the state in a sense. It doesn't, it doesn't bind it 
and it's the same way it binds you and me, but it does bind it. And they don't really have a good account of how the state gets out of the survival constraint. Um, so that's the, my, my issue with the chartless, and the paper really sort of focuses mainly on them. In another paper, I've dealt with uh, the banking school question, is that what is it exactly that makes the state a special bank? What is their account of hierarchy? What generates hierarchy in financial systems? Um, and do, and, and it, it strikes me that they don't, they're right, of course, in outlining that financial systems are hierarchical, but what exactly drives hierarchy in financial systems is slightly under-theorized there. Um, and so I would make the claim that, you know, putting these two things together a little bit, that democratic sovereignty, indeed redefining sovereignty as democratic sovereignty, namely legitimation of rule by the ruled, this makes this, this is what centrally drives and makes the state a special kind of bank with the best kind of money. That's, that's sort of the claim that I'm going to try and run through very quickly in the time that I have. And forgive me for being telegraphic, but as I say, in the interest of time, but this is the kind of syllogism how it runs. So what is democratic sovereignty? Basically, it's, it's not to be confused with procedural democracy. Today, which is to say since the 16th, 17th century, the dominant notion of sovereignty is democratic sovereignty. No, we don't, the rule doesn't happen in the name of uh, the divine right of kings or something like that, right? It's, it's basically legitimated by the people. This is true for a very broad set of regimes. Iran is the Islamic Republic for better or worse. China is the People's Republic, uh, and so on and so on. So even if it's a sort of eyewash, no one claims sovereignty in the name of anything other than the demos anymore. And that's important, because that is a very key legitimating function of the state. And it enables the state, a democratic state, to do things, do more things, generally and with money, than it would otherwise. So that's as far as dem democratic sovereignty is concerned, and that is already a kind of shift in the notion of sovereignty that is dominant in the chartless literature. The survival constraint is this idea from Minsky. Basically, I, I see it as his reading of Marx's double freedom, that capitalism is a cash nexus. Uh, and if you don't have cash, liquid cash, acceptable means of payment, then you're going to struggle. Uh, we all need that to live, and we have to beg, borrow, steal to get it, in particular, borrow pledge something, pledge an IOU that may or may not be acceptable on differential terms in order to access liquid funds to live under capitalist construction. And, and this binds the state as well. The state uh, is not able merely to tax, uh, to, to, to spend into, into uh, money into, into circulation because acceptance is not guaranteed ipso facto. It's based in democratic sovereignty. And that's, that comes to the simple idea that taxes are not simply cancellation of money, but taxation is exchanged for representation. Right? This liquidity that the state's IOU has doesn't come from pure coercion. It, is, it comes because it's embedded, its money is accepted in a sense. The state's money is accepted because it is, the state is legitimate in some way. It's not pure coercion, it's coercion plus consent, it's coercion embedded in legitimacy, it's coercion based in a political settlement that we can call democratic sovereignty. So the baseline of liquidity, the, the ability to, for taxes to drive money is, is further embedded in a, in a political structure. And it's that political structure, it's that political embedding quite centrally that we can see as democratic sovereignty that the chartlists are kind of um, giving short shrift. So what does democratic sovereignty do? DS is democratic sovereignty. It basically ensures a kind of commercial logic. It generates a kind of commercial logic. It says, because of democratic sovereignty, people are happy to pledge their cash, their future income, to the state in form of future taxes. And that future cash flow, discounted back to the present, is value. That's how you value an asset, right? A future stream of incomes discounted back to the present, right? Democratic sovereignty generates the best assets. So a political logic generates economic value, right? So it's, 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 that, it's that commercial logic element of the banking school, but understood through a political logic, uh, namely democratic sovereignty. So democratic sovereignty gives the state the best assets, and that's why the state's IOUs are the best IOUs. The state can leverage up because its asset base is us, right? We all pay into the state in a sense. In, in, in Perry Merling's phrase, the state is a kind of social mutual fund. And that's why it's the, it, can, it, can, it can do a kind of 
it can do the banking business better than anyone else can. The state revenue, in OECD countries, state revenue is of the order, even in the US, of 30% of GDP. No other economic entity is, is as large, is measured in, percentage, in terms of percentage terms of GDP as large, right? The state is an economic leviathan precisely because it's a political leviathan. Um, so that, that gives us a kind of, so, so that enables democratic sovereignty to bend the survival constraint it can't break it. It still is subject to it. The, the, you know, the, there, are, there is a requirement for, uh, for liquid funds, but it can bend it. This is what monetary sovereignty is. It's not the issuance by fiat. It's the bending of the economic logic of liquidity. It can bend it the furthest, farther than any other entity can bend it, because it's this behemoth. It can, can bend that constraint the farther by grounding money, if you like, in value. Now, this is... Uh, gets us to theories of value. If you're a classical Marxist or you indeed uh, uh, believe in the classical dichotomy in any way, there's, there's the, this past orientation of value. This is obviously predicating value in the future. Some would call that fictitious, but that's a story for another day. This is, this, this is obviously the, the most controversial point, as it were. So I, I chose to focus on it in terms of the chart list, right? Why is it, in what way can we seriously say that the state is bound. This is the state, right? This is the, it has all the guns. Like, in what way is the state bound by the survival constraint, right? And Chartists will say it isn't. It really isn't. And this is why, notwithstanding their doffing their hat or more to Minsky, the Chartists are really smuggling in a fiat logic into a creditary logic. Because credit is. Uh, is, is a two-sided, so they're like creditors, what creditors? Bond vigilantes? No, not really. If that's just ideology. Ingham says this. Uh, uh, Randy Ray says this, right? The, the, the bond vigilante idea, the idea that uh, if you spend too much, but the bond market will drop your paper and run, and you will thereby be constrained in your spending as a state, that idea is not an institutional constraint for these people. It is merely an ideological constraint, because that's the rules of the game under capitalism, right? Uh, and so we just have to get right thinking on this, and then, hey presto, we'll be able to just you know, spend money into existence. That, uh, um, so this is sort of credit by fiat, if you like. This is smuggling in a fiat logic into this dyadic, fraught relationship that is credit, right? So you've smuggled, you've, you've kind of, wished away ex hypothesi all the complicated, interesting political economy features of credit just with a, with a wave of your hand, which is why I'm saying it's a thin theory of politics that undergirds the chart list idea. So credit is not fiat. Credit is a bargain. There's two sides to credit, right? Um, Minsky's, one of Minsky's favorite aphorisms, of course, is that anyone can issue money. The problem is to get it accepted, right? And the problem of acceptance the very center of Minsky's concept of, uh, of uh, credit is wished away entirely because acceptance is just ruled as not an issue a priori you know, in this line of thinking. There's also a, a, a time inconsistency problem with the state, right? The state, it's a kind of uh, consumption smoothing story where the state has to spend all the time, especially in wartime as we, uh, as we saw. The state needs money now, but taxation happens over a period of time. It's lumpy, so you need a kind of smoothing function to get you out. So the state is always in a position to borrow. In a sense, the state is always highly solvent for reasons that we saw. It has the best assets, but it's always illiquid, right? And um, and and this getting this getting the states are you accepted? As I say, is predicated in a kind of political settlement, and it is a deeply political fact. So you get this kind of politics between a balance of power, if you like, between surplus agents, and deficit agents. And the irony here is that this is exactly Ingham's account of the rise of capitalism. Capitalism, and he says it's a wholly contingent you know, uh, story. It didn't have to happen this way, so there's no teleology here. But capitalism in early modern Britain happened by way of precisely such a balance of power, where you had a resurgent bourgeoisie holding up the the, the, the sovereign who wanted to spend because of war, and out of which came parliament, right? A shared sovereignty, king in parliament. Sovereignty, the very nub of the chartlist argument was hybridized, right? It became shared. Um, but this Ingham sees as just a kind of uh, 
just capitalism. Capitalist money is kind of parochialized. And that confuses me. Why is capitalist money parochialized? He says, you know, this doesn't have to happen this way. It just happened, happened to happen under capitalism. But surely capitalist money is the best money we have. Capitalism isn't a historical outlier. Capitalism is the Weberian ideal type. Uh, I, and if capitalism is the Weberian ideal, capitalist money is the Weberian ideal type, then surely the nature of sovereignty undergirding capitalism is equally ideal typical. Namely, hybridized sovereignty, shared sovereignty. And that's all that democratic sovereignty is. It's just shared broader. It's just shared over, over more shoulders. Um, and that's, so, so that's a kind of the, the rudiments, if you like, of something like a political theory of money, which might be distinguished from a state theory of money. Um, a sovereign people pledge a share of their future product to the state. The people are sovereign, not the government. Randy Ray says sovereignty lies with the state. That's, the, that's, that's merely a confusion. The people are sovereign, right? Uh, uh, and they, this is a, a confusion between this, what the state, uh, uh, the sovereign and the government. The government is the agent of the people. The people, and Richard Tuck is a denizen of these parts, talks about a sleeping sovereign, right? The people may wake up only once every once in a while, but sovereignty, ownership of the state resides with them. And they can choose a form of government. Obviously, this idea goes back to Rousseau. Um, which is monarchical, but it's no less democratic because ultimately the sovereignty is with, is with people. So the state, the people are sovereign, not the government, and the state is, is, is solvent precisely because the people are sovereign. The state is solvent because the people are sovereign. An, a a non-democratic state without the kind of catchment area of all its taxpayers paying in is, is simply not a solvent and is therefore not a sovereign. Um, so sovereign people make a state a special bank, which then um, produces the best money. Here's some uh, distinctions between uh, this kind of way of thinking and, and the state theory. Um, and um, I'll end there. Thank you, Anush, and thank you for uh, keeping to time, because I know it's hard. Um, Jami, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Chris, for this uh, great event. Um, thank you all. Uh, and also a special shout out to my long-suffering students who showed up, at, some of them at 1 AM last night, to attend this conference. Um, uh, OK, so I'm just going to get into it. Um, this is a, a big project, and it's about the story of industrialization and the mobilization of money. Um, and what I'm going to do in the 15 minutes I have is focus on one particular dimension to this, to this story, which is the relationship between uh, the state and the Bank of France, the central bank. And I'm going to be focusing on from the early 19th century to the end of the Fourth Republic, which is about 1958. Now, much of the literature on uh, state-led industrialization focuses on the, on the success stories, such as Japan, South Korea, and China. Uh, by studying its industrialization history from the early 19th century, uh, I chose to study uh, state-led industrialization in France because its degree of success was middling. And I'll, at the end of the talk, I'll come to why I chose that. Um, as in Japan and elsewhere, uh, France in the post-war period pursued a model of what is called indicative planning, so not central planning, but indicative planning, in which the state played an extensive role in promoting export-led industrialization. I argue that the challenges and achievements of the, of the post-war period uh, to promote large-scale firms can only be understood in the context of its previous monetary history. I focus on the politics of money in general and credit in particular because there's an established literature, and I'm specifically thinking here about Alexander Gershenkron and, of course, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, that has stressed the role that an elastic supply of credit is absolutely central uh, for progressively greater outlays of, uh, of capital, fixed capital. So following uh, contemporary authors such as Chris, um, uh, Dasan, and Omarova, and Hockett, and Ricks, and others, my framework assumes that money is fundamentally a public good, since capital accumulation is by definition the accumulation of money, uh, and politics acting through the law is central to business investment. This is the general consensus. 
uh, in this literature on state-led industrialization, it necessarily follows that the politics of money is also central to the story of industrialization, definitionally true. That is, in order to understand a particular type of industrial experience, uh, we need to ask how is money created and how does it flow give, to give rise to markets? What are the political and legal foundations of markets? It must be said at the outset that before uh, World War II, French industrialization was not overall an exemplary success story, since even as late as the 1930s, uh, British, German, and American firms dominated global markets. With the exception of success in certain sectors, overall French industry was reliant on retained earnings, and this is a really important point, was reliant on retained earnings instead of bank credit for, fin for investment finance. That necessarily restrained their ability uh, to benefit from uh, exploiting economies of scale and scope. So in this talk, I will primarily focus on the Bank of France, which was, of course, at the heart of the banking system. What I discuss is, a, is an interesting um, cooperatively conflictual relationship between the BOF and the Treasury, and that it is this dynamic put in the context of the broader industrialization strategy, which I shall not tell you about right now because I will not have the time for that, but that's in the paper, um, which, and that it's that relationship which structured credit flows and thus the nature of the industrialization experience itself. So here are the key aspects of this relationship. The BOF was uh, always a banker of the state. Uh, it was a consortium of private investors, um, <clears throat> but its institutional relationship to the state was captured by the following significant declaration of Bonaparte before the Council of the State in 1806, quote, the bank does not only belong to its shareholders, it also belongs to the state because the latter gives it the privilege to create money. I want the bank to be sufficiently hand in the hands of the government, but not too much. Okay, now that I put in quotes because that I would argue is really where the story of that conflictual relationship uh, begins. It was the monopoly emitter of notes, so the lesser fair philosophy which uh, which was the ideological outcome of the revolution was taken by proponents of free banking who were also supporters uh, for an expansion of credit right, uh, to fuel business investment. Um, and the, so the laissez faire philosophy uh, for some authors was, uh, the logic of that was that there should be free banking and multiple emitters of currency. Their argument was that free market competition would weed out banks with lower quality notes, uh, just like competition in regular markets. Um, uh, and this, you know, this was opposed by um, others, uh, especially the Bank of France and its patrons in the state, who objected that by by saying that multiple, who objected by saying that multiple uh, banknote emission would produce an excessive supply of money, of fiduciary money, and that would generate inflation and undermine the public's faith in the currency. And I'm not going to get into here whether there was any substance to that argument, but that's the argument that was made, and that was actually a kind of a general consensus. So here's what happened. Uh, the BOF's hegemony was reinforced by being granted the legal, legal privilege um, of being the monopoly uh, emitter of currency of banknotes after 1848. Before that, it was, uh, it was restricted to Paris. But this was not a permanent privilege, um, since it was subject to periodic renewal. Uh, and this renewal was, uh, was then like the proverbial sort of Damocles that hung over the BOF, reinforcing the political power of the state. So the government had already determined the precious metal content of coin. And then by conferring legal status to the BOF's banknotes, uh, the value of the, of the franc was determined because the government spent and taxed in that currency, which is a familiar story to those of you who have studied this kind of stuff in other contexts. At least until the mid-19th uh, century, the state, uh, with active support of the Bank of France, was quite successful in maintaining tight control over the banking sector, uh, and thus the supply of credit. Um, there were restrictions on the granting of limited liability, so Societe Anonyme, uh, which restrained the growth of banks and, and, and therefore non-banks because the supply of credit was somehow restricted. And it was only really in the uh, very important legislations in the 1860s that in the wake of, of these legislations that there was liberalization of uh, 
the limited liability notion, and there was heightened supply of credit and concentration in the banking sector. Now, significantly, all sides, including those who supported an extended credit supply, uh, su uh, they, they, they were supportive of a convertibility between, the, between banknotes and precious metals. So Article 5 of the statutes of February 13, 1800 specified the need for prudence in terms of the relationship between the maturities of the BOF banknotes and its stock of precious metals. Now, this last point is what I, is, I think is the basis of what I call a governance conundrum. Okay, clearly the BOF, private investors, they had to be kept satisfied, and this meant allowing them to pursue their monetarist inclinations. This meant that control over the, this meant that there had to be some sort of control over the supply of credit. And yet, industrialization and infrastructure creation, um, for example, railroads, in which the, the French state embarked on a massive scale in the 1830s, 1840s, that required an expansive supply of credit. So credit supply needed to expand, and yet it needed to be kept within bounds. And you can see the issue right there. So what, so what we then observe is that this conundrum culminated in a kind of an uneasy compromise that I think is well captured by this following observation by the historian Jean Bouvier, and maybe some of my French-speaking colleagues over here can make sure that I translated this right, um, who said that um, the fiduciary emission flow being more stable accompanies the growth of the metal stock, but always stays above it at variable distances. The metallic guarantee of paper currency, a relationship which was supported at the time period, does not imply a full coverage of the latter by the former. However, the growth of metal reserves supported the growth of banknotes at the same time as the latter related to the rise in market transactions engendered, which engendered the growth of metal reserves. So what he was implicitly pointing to here, so if you look at the chart on the left, that shows from 1806 to 1913, it shows banknotes, and it shows metal reserves. Uh, the right-hand side is the natural log. So the slope of a natural log gives you the percentage change. What he was implicitly pointing to was what um, we call a co-integrated relationship. And so I'm not going to give you a lecture on econometrics over here. But the basic point here with, with regard to variables that you see are co-trended is, is that co-trend a spurious correlation? Or is there some story linking the two? You know, it's just like two cars that you observe on the highway. They drift apart, they come back together. Is this purely coincidental? Or is one adjusting its speed to the other? Uh, or are they both adjusting to each other so that you get a rough co-movement over time? So what we find then, theoretically speaking, behind the story is industrialization is proceeding, industrialization, industrialization is generating an expansion of banknotes. That banknotes are themselves are driving the accumulation of metal reserves, but at the same time, the central bank is pursuing a less than full accommodating position with regard to banknotes, so it's also pulling at uh, banknotes, so you get this rough co-movement over time. Actually, it's much more, much, you know, it's actually not so much a rough, it's a pretty close movement. Um, <clears throat> this implies that there had to have been a continuous inflow of precious metals, gold and silver, but primarily gold, into the country uh, via the balance of payments. Um, so the politics of international capital flows becomes a really crucial part to the story. Um, the other part to the conundrum was that the Bank of France was not at a liberty to raise interest rates as it wanted to in order to attract capital because the state required interest rates to be low and stable. So somehow this stuff was coming in in order to fuel industrialization. Um, and I suggest, I don't get into that in, in this paper, but that's another future paper, is that the question of mining and gold flows and silver flows from the periphery, from the colonies, which I think would be familiar to many of you, was, uh, was a crucial part to the story of industrialization in Europe. Right? So this, of course, Marx talks about this. Others have talked about this. We don't get into that here, but that's an interesting implication here. Flash forward 
uh, to the late 19th century, 1897 extended the note issuing privilege, but also deepened the bank's obligations to the treasury. But the bank was not a passive absorber of governmental diktats, not surprisingly given that the government had to incentivize it for it to be even in business. But the conflictually cooperative relationship began to become more, um, move more in the direction of conflict um, as we proceeded into the 19th century and certainly into the 20th century. Um, and though that conflict became much more acute in the interwar period. Um, <clears throat> by the 1930s, many forces on the left, actually that started earlier, were, were demanding the need for economic planning or dirigisme and the democratization of credit. Opposition to the BOF's political power increased quite dramatically. Uh, there was growing recognition, especially in the 1930s, that the political power of the bank was suffocating attempts by the government uh, to implement radically new policies that required greater political control over the flow of credit. In short, newer political measures were needed to overcome the power exercised by the bank and other banks. So in the Great Depression, some important organizational changes to the bank were brought up, including those that reduced its operational autonomy quite significantly, but, and this is an important point, it was not nationalized. This is a really important, even by the Popular Front, the left coalition that was elected in 1936, Leon Blum, its uh, administration. So, but taken together, what we observe is that in this period from the end of the, well, beginning of the First World War into the Great Depression and certainly after the war, into the war, the Second World War, um, there were a series of political changes that eventually defanged the, um, the central bank. And so you see on the left, the, um, the story fall apart, the, the relationship fell apart, the co-integrating relationship fell apart. And interestingly, when the whole model changed after the Second World War with the nationalization of the Bank of France, and uh, a very export-led industrialization, very technocratic, productivist way uh, of organizing uh, industry. Again, we see at least into the fifth, into the fourth republic. Again, that co-integrating relationship appear. So, what we see then, um, in terms of Duncan Kennedy's uh, classic article on Hale, that over time, what we see is a gradual destabilization of the background laws underpinning the uh, the uh, the central bank. And that eventually led to its full nationalization and the creation of a new kind of development model after the Second World War. Okay, conclusion. So a persistent theme in this paper is that money was always treated as a public good, as much so after the Second World War as way back. The regime, so economic planning, intermingled with less affair all the way through, whereas the conventional view often is that the regime was only after the war and it was less affair before. I would argue that it was always intermingled. Um, much of the debate on the state and development tends to be painted in very black and white terms. That state-led industrialization was a shining success. This is the usual claim by heterodox economists. Or that it was a failure. That's the neoclassical view. I chose France because its industrialization experience presents itself as a particular shade of gray. Um, as an institutionally grounded heterodox economist, so I'm coming out of the closet over here, I'm not, you know, I'm an economist, um, I conclude that bringing back the old notion of money as blood, one that needs to be produced in political communities, can teach us a lot about the shades of gray that one observes in industrialization experiences. That's it. That's it, guys. Well, thank you very much. Good morning, uh, everyone. Um, and first of all, thank you, Christine, and all the organizers for putting this great event together. And thank you um, for having me here. Um, as you saw, if you see the title of my talk, it's called um, Capital Rules by Law. So the unit of my analysis 
um, for this talk and for the book project from with which this chapter has been drawn is capital rather than money. And I will make the connection um, in a second. Let me just um, say in broad terms where I want to go. So uh, um, I think I want to complicate the, the stories that you've just heard, including Christine's presentation up front, by bringing two things in. One is um, private institutions of law. Um, Anush has spoken about contracts and credit, but I want to go a little further and talk about other um, institutions of private law that have been critical in coding capital, including debt or credit as one of the core capital assets that we have. And the other complications that I, that I want to um, throw in is, is globalization. Um, and so I think my basic claim is that, especially in times of globalization, the idea that we could design um, money top down or sort of try to get a control over the money supply, especially the private money supply, um, is problematic. Um, unfortunately so for our democratic um, ambitions, but I think we have to realize how the machine works to know uh, um, uh, what we can do and what we cannot do. Um, so let me just start by saying that, yes, I think money is a, a sovereign project. And I do buy, certainly normatively, in Anur's uh, project that it has to be a democratic uh, project. Um, uh, um, and the state, however, is also behind private money, but in a peculiar way. And I just want to talk a little bit about that. So the state is not directly producing private money. And it's not only giving franchises to banks to produce that money, but the private sector is producing certain claims and making, availing itself of certain institutions of the law to do so. So very simply put, I'm basically arguing in, in my book, which is called The Code of Capital, is that um, capital is coded in law has always been coded in law. And, um, and what the institutions that um, we have used for centuries to code capital are contract law. That's sort of the easiest. But it's property. Property law, collateral law, trust. The common law trust is critical. Corporate law and bankruptcy law. Um, and these institutions are um, malleable. And they are changed and adapted and transposed and grafted onto different assets, mostly by lawyers on behalf of certain types of clients. It's a highly decentralized project that avails itself indirectly of state power, but not necessarily directly. You don't need ex ante approval to do so. All you need is a state or an agent of the state, a court, to vindicate the coding process ex post facto. And you don't even need that all the time, because if it's assumed that this is legal, and if you do it in a way that is similar to ways in which other assets had already been um, coded in capital and had been sanctioned by a court of law, then you don't necessarily face a challenge in court. And so you just can't do it. And so I think what lawyers have done over the centuries, they have basically pushed the limits of fa how far you can go and how much the courts are willing to vindicate um, and to create new types of assets and use the same institutions um, time and again. So, so what do these institutions do when I saw, why do I, why, do I, why do I choose property and trust and corporate law and bankruptcy? You can add more. I'm just sort of saying these are the core institutions. What they really do, and that's why we also need the backing of the state, is that they graft certain attributes on simple assets. So take a simple asset, a piece of land, or take, take even a simple asset, a claim that I have against any one of you. How can I flip this into something that is wealth producing? So capital as a private wealth producing asset. Well, I give it priority rights over competing claims. So my claim is stronger than anybody else's claim against you. right? So if I can negotiate this in some ways or can get backing for that, ideally I use collateral. So that's the next ad an item. If I have a collateral, a secure, um, secured in interest, um, I can enforce better than anybody else. If I have a property right, I can, I can own and seize this asset. I can seize it in, in, even in, in, in a context where a debtor might be bankrupt. If I own the asset, I can get it out of the pool. So in some, some sense, I, I'm saying bankruptcy is a wonderful um, asset test to see um, what assets really um, have value against others. And, and, and Because in bankruptcy, of course, by definition, you don't have enough assets to satisfy everybody. So you can look at who gets priority, who has ownership gets priority, who has secured assets gets priority um, over others. Then, of course, the good old common trust. And that's, um, I think, one of the greatest advantages, if you want to put it in those ways, of the common law system. It's basically a contractual device to alter property rights for no one else to see, really, necessarily. And But you pull out the deed of trust in times of conflicts and say, oh, you know, I'm no longer the owner, so you can't really tax me, or you know, my creditors can't come um, come after me because I have already transferred formal title to the trustee. The trustee is only the formal title holder. Its creditors can't go after the asset because it doesn't have the economic benefits, and the beneficiary doesn't really have the benefit quite yet. So it's difficult to tax or enforce against his assets as well. And that has changed over time, but that's sort of the the beauty of the tr trust, which is why it has been this fantastic um, instrument to shield wealth from different private credit 
just and from the states to the state, right? So trust is the major tax avoidance scheme, um, I think, even even to this um, day. So private money. Private credit is sort of coded in similar ways. You know, I use collateral. I use um, 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 in enforcement through contracts and other other devices to to create that private money. But it doesn't really have the state as an active participant in the production process. It has it as a passive bystander and relies on the willingness and the hope that the bet, if you wish, that these um, contracts can be enforced in the court of law if and when challenged. But even if challenged later on, you get some mileage out of having done this and getting a comparative advantage of being ahead of everybody else in making money in the meantime. And only rarely will this, um, will this be, be taken back even if you, um, if, if later on, sort of a, a device might be deemed to be illegal, so I said one thing that you need to do is you, you need to code um, the attribute of um, priority onto an asset to flip it into capital. There are three other attributes um, that I would add. One, another one is durability. Uh, that's less important in finance. It's really important in, in in land and other assets. So one way to create durability is to protect an asset from bankruptcy. And English law has done this for estate holders basically until the very end of the 19th century through something that's very similar to trust. You could basically throw um, your, um, you, you would entail the family estate and the life tenant only had certain rights to the land but couldn't alter it. And a creditor could seize, even if, if, he, if he had a mortgage, he could seize only half of the land and never the family mansion. That's how you basically keep the family wealth protected against creditors. And that was in England you know, throughout the industrialization until the very end of the, of the 19th century. So durability is important for some assets. For financial assets, another um, attribute is really critical, and that's convertibility. And convertibility is not only that I can assign or transfer my interest, but convertibility means I can flip it into a state money, right? I have an option to, try, uh, to, to flip my, my private claims, which might not have much value um, anymore, and I can flip it into state money. The beauty of that, I saw Morgan already here, the, um, the, the beauty of that is to say that the state sort of protects the nominal value of my assets. So I can lock in the value that I have made in the past by flipping it into state money. If I have an option to do this at any point in time, I have a comparative advantage over others. If I have the power or I have created, created a put option that a state is reluctant to deny, then I can do this in the midst of the crisis as well. Um, and then finally, we need universal enforceability. That's where the state really comes in. So if in doubt and I really need to have enforcement, then I um, can make a claim against others who have never been part of the game. Right. So it's not only contract. Contracts I'm by myself vis-a-vis -vis persons I've really contracted with. But with property rights and trust and corporate law and bankruptcy law, I basically create claims that will be enforced through coercive powers if necessary against third parties who have never been part of the game. That's the beauty of these types of legal devices. And that gives them the kind of power. Because they are in private hands largely, and um, sophisticated laws, lawyers have honed their skills over centuries and how to um, use them. There's a parallel process to, to the top-down process that is going on and that's quite powerful in creating these kind of assets through all these various devices that I had um, um, mentioned. So that's the private um, law part of the story that I think it's sort of, it's, it is a, it, it, you can tell it as a purely domestic story. You can even um, complicate it by saying if you have regulatory competition as you've had in the United States because it's a federal system and most of the laws I'm describing are actually in the hands of the states in this country. So you can sort of push the limits by basically transferring your transaction into an, another state's law, right? You just opt into another state's law and since this has been sanctioned as part of interstate commerce protected by the constitution, you can actually play one legal system them off against each other at that at that level. So, so that's that's quite powerful. Now add to that globalization, right? So what we've done, been able to do through regulatory competition within the United States for centuries now has become possible at the global level. Because many states, and so at the global level, again, I think most of the action is in private law, so it's in national law, but the beauty is that you can opt into certain national laws. So the global system, I would sort of, as a hypothetical, you could say the global financial system could be uh, coded in a single domestic legal system as long as all other states respect and enforce the legal rights that are being 
created under that legal system. Um, in fact, I think we have two legal systems that sustain our global financial system. That's the law of England and the law of the state of New York, um, if you think of it from a private law perspective. Most globally traded financial assets are coded in one of these laws. Most law firms who do this stuff sit in London or, or, this, um, or, um, or, or, or New York. And of course, most of the banks who um, issue these assets um, sit in these two um, uh, places as well. So once you put, put this in, in place, and so there's no, you know, there is of course some globalization, there's some treaty law that you need for this as well, and that and lends additional power to it. I will come back to the New York Convention in a second. But when, once you add um, in the possibility to opt into different legal systems, how do you do that? Conflict of law rules, right? And mutual recognition. Um, and so, but I think most of, one of the most powerful is really conflict of law rules and the shift that we've seen over the last 30 years to give a lot of um, uh, umph to private autonomy. Used to be that contracts, yeah, you could opt into the legal system by which your contract shall be governed for a very long time. But um, today it's, of course, possible to opt into corporate law. Right, the um, the seat, the real seat theory is pretty much out of the window. We say incorporation, a corporation which is a creature of the law, it's created by law, it doesn't exist outside the law, but most states will recognize a corporation if it has followed the rules of the state in which it has been incorporated. Without that, things like tax havens and the Cayman Island, et cetera, would be much more complicated. Of course, you could use uh, maybe the trust as well, but the trust is not as widely recognized as the corporation, for example, um, around uh, around uh, the globe. So through these mechanisms, we basically have a situation, and I'm only, only slightly overstating it, that if I think of it as a lawyer and I want to create a financial asset, a new sort of form of a like, CDO, CLO, and just securitize some assets, I basically have a menu of, of tools. I have my trust, I have my corporate law, I have my, my collateral, my property rights, my contract, and I basically pick and choose from the legal systems, like a menu in a restaurant, which I will use for a particular type of transaction to code um, the interest of my, of my client. Clients, backed by the assumption that these interests will be protected not only in a tiny little jurisdiction such as, let's say, the Cayman Islands or even the state of New York, but that I can trade these assets globally because most other states will recognize these contractual devices and lend their enforcement powers to them. Um, and just one in, um, additional thought on the enforcement, um, enforcing, um, 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 so courts might, might hear these cases and enforce them. Many of these tra private transactions are increasingly um, um, not brought to courts, but um, handled in private arbitral tribunals. And for that, we have the beautiful New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of International Foreign Arbitration Tribunals um, um, Awards, which basically says that members of this convention 180 plus countries around the world will not review the merits of the tribunal's rulings, but will lend its coercive powers to their enforcement if brought to their shores and if there are any assets in that particular um, region. Through that, we have basically created a <laughs> private enforcement regime where the courts are no longer the guardians of the law, but simply the executioners of um, the rulings that private arbitral tribunals um, um, render. So I think if you, if you think basically at you know the production of capital in particular money capital um, in our days we are we're living of course in the in the in the age of um, uh, um, financial capital and and global financial capital if you look at it bottom up from this particular perspective you see how complicated it is just to regain control over these processes. And some of the processes, of course, are also be deeply baked in into our constitutional orders. They might be abused. There's a better way to think about how to do this. But we have private property rights, right? So once certain types of claims have been recognized as private property rights, including expectations to future returns, which courts have recognized as private property rights, it's much harder to dislodge them even at a domestic level. At a global level, if you can pick, pick, pick and choose, if one country sort of reigns and pushes back, you try to go into a different country. Now, having said that, I do believe that if the US and England started serious reforms, we might be in a better world. I don't think that any tiny country in the world outside these two jurisdictions will much, make much of a dent. They could be like a, you know, like a, they could um, try it out or they could, could do a pilot study on how you might be able to do, to roll back some of these um, ex excesses in using private law institutions to create private wealth at the exclusion of others. But I, I think the, the, the key action would have to be done either here um, or in England and ideally by both. Thank you. Thank you.
thanks. Um, so I'm going to take a few minutes to uh, try to read uh, Katerina and Anush and, and Jami one against the other um, uh, with each other and, and against each other. I mean, uh, in a sort of soup, uh, trying to trying to talk about these three uh, papers all at once in in a short amount of time is is a bit of a mean trick. But I'm going to uh, give it a give it a try. So uh, the, I've had the pleasure of reading uh, Katarina's book, not only the, the chapter. Um, and so I'll try to use that more or less as the frame to talk about, about the three presentations. Um, and I, th I think one of the ways to think about the book is in the context of the literature that's uh, been so influenced by, by Piketty's Capital in the 21st century over the last few years. Uh, that book took up one strand of historical evolution in Marx. Uh, according to which class antagonism plays out in economic struggle, where capital extracts surplus value from labor in a progressive manner till you get to a crisis point. Um, Piketty pointed to an economic logic that was compatible with Marx's analysis, but located slightly at a different level of generalization. The dangerous part of the logic, according to Piketty, was that capital increases, or the returns to capital increase uh, faster than growth, and meaning that means that capital holders will progressively capture most of society's output or more of society's output than anybody else. And they leave the rest behind, and that generates dangerous social effects. Um, the problem with, with Piketty's book, I think, for, for a lot of, certainly for a lot of legal scholars, um, and maybe for, for others, was that it didn't really have an account of the mechanism by which returns to capital outpace growth. That is, that was posited as a sort of iron law and economic law. Uh, there, there were exceptions, but they came from bursts of technology or war, uh, things that were sort of outside, outside the frame, exogenous shocks. Um, and for the last few years, I think certainly in the, in the legal academy, what a lot of people have been doing is trying to look for ways to think about the mechanisms for that kind of thing happening to the extent that, it, to the extent that you believe that, it's, that it does characterize uh, Long periods of long periods of development. Um, now, Katarina's book, *The Code of Capital*, uh, I think offers answers to some of those some of those issues, and they're at least as unsettling as the insights that are offered by by Piketty. In fact, because the book takes seriously the mechanisms by which capital accumulates, rather than seeing that accumulation as a result of some black box or economic logic, it actually puts a spotlight not necessarily on the entire historical process, but I think a spotlight on, the, on what's really special about the last 40 years. That is, what, the, what's become the most important dynamic in global financial capitalism, the capitalism that we, uh, that we live in, um, and how, the, that, how a particular set of mechanisms uh, really accelerate uh, to the point where we might be in a situation that's significantly different from, uh, from the past. Um, and, and I think one of the key things to notice is that we're not only concerned with the question of capital accumulation, uh, which is too general a, a phrase, I think, but the thing that is troubling is capital concentration uh, or radicalization of the distributive impact of the mechanisms through which we have seen capital accumulation going on in the last 40 years. Um, and so how does... The, the book work, uh, it offers an account of legal change that follows the desires of economic agents trying to make the most of their assets. Uh, one way they do this is by grafting onto those assets attributes that transform them uh, from simple values into capital. So if this were Marx talking about it, he would talk about these as actually the process of valorization. Um, and as uh, she just mentioned, there are four important attributes, priority, durability, convertibility, and universality. Um, and the overall theory is meant to be completely general. I think the different assets behave differently. Um, but I'll concentrate from now on for the rest of the, almost almost exclusively uh, just on financial products. Um, and the changes that lawyers are trying to make to financial products in order to turn them into capital uh, are actually exactly the kinds of things that 
that economists talk about when they talk about safe assets. Right? They're, um, they're trying to give the assets the features that um, actually make them behave more and more like money. So they try to take assets that are, uh, you know, that are initially just promises and make them look more and more like money. Uh, and that's why there, there's a recurrent metaphor of, of minting in the book, and it makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, now, there are a bunch of different tactics that are at work here, different processes. They come to a head uh, or a critical mass over the last 40 years when financial capitalism, I think, kicks into such high gear that it becomes a new kind of threat to sovereignty. And I'll have a little more to say about that in, the, in a moment, and that'll bring, bring together these, the presentations. Um, now, some of the dynamics are old. So uh, the, the book references uh, the enclosure movement, a lot of things about feudal England. There are a few examples from Rome. Um, but, uh, but I think things are actually quite different when, when they become dominant. So when things take on a critical mass, uh, their overall effect is different. Size matters. Um, and things that were once possibly uh, present in some form of a kernel uh, become actually dominant. And they're, on the one hand, easier to see than once they become so dominant. Um, but they may even change their meaning. So think about how difficult it was for, uh, this is just a sort of anecdote about how, how things that are small are maybe difficult to see. Uh, in the early 70s, Milton Friedman wrote an article about euro dollars, trying to explain that euro dollars are actually an expansion of the American money supply. Their, their creation of uh, their money creation outside the US banking system and outside regulation. And lots of economists try, jumped down his throat and said, no, 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 this is a balance of trade thing. It's not actually money creation. It's a different thing altogether. You, you know, you're confused. Now, when the market was very, very small, that, that kind of denial about what was going on in euro dollars might have not been crazy. I think today, uh, when, I don't know if uh, you know, Morgan could, could tell me if it's past 5 trillion or not past 5 trillion, but uh, when, when, the, when the size of the euro dollar market is, uh, is beyond any one uh, aspect of the money supply, it's clear that, uh, that, that that's what is happening. That is private, something that begins uh, privately without any public sanction is recognized and absorbed uh, and goes to the very heart of what the, what the money system becomes. Um, OK. so. Uh, now to bring these things together, Jamie and, and, and Katrina, uh, I think, begin with a similar insight. Um, and this is a general insight about property systems. Property systems define who can make use of resources and in what way. And a property system is a regime of rules. Uh, it's basic building blocks or statements of law. So, so this, is, this brings their, uh, their outlook together. Um, those are legal determinations about rights, privilege, powers, and, powers and immunities that people enjoy vis-a-vis -vis one another in relation to resources. It's a shorthand. Um, so, as as Chris said in the in the beginning, you know, li there are liberal mythologies of rights that try to paint a picture of the property regime as pre-political, um, or as a one-time political settlement that defines constitutionally the realm of individual freedom. Uh, and for all these accounts that are really typical of a lot of economic thinking, the important point is that the regime is just once and for all. Perhaps it evolves very slowly piecemeal in the way that custom evolves, but it's found, it's spontaneous, it's non-directed, it's not open to manipulation except by the kind of abuse uh, that's initiated by sort of rapacious, uh, rapacious states. But uh, Katarina and, and, and Jami actually, you know, they link on to legal realists and critical legal studies work uh, in this field and say emphatically, no, uh, these systems are constantly in flux. That is, the, the property regime is always moving. Um, they cannot avoid infusing their development with endless value judgments well beyond some abstract sense of uh, protecting or instantiating freedom. Um, and in this, they're very much on the same page. Um, 
but there's more. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a sort of a stylized statement of saying, oh, well, these things aren't neutral, they entail value judgments, but then there's another, uh, there's another step. Um, and, and here's where, where I think things get, uh, get interesting and controversial. So in, in Katarina's vision, people who have assets direct their lawyers to improve those assets along the lines of priority, durability, convertibility, and universality. Sometimes they need the state to do this. And in that case, they, they might lobby. They might even try to capture. At other times, they can just innovate contractually. And then they navigate the system as best they can, either to avoid detection, or they play at low visibility politics to get unheralded recognition by administrators um, for the innovations. And this, this kind of piecemeal action to change, to change the system, this kind of playing for the rules, is especially powerful when the resources in question are more abstract. So why is that? Um, for, for these assets, there's really no fallback without the law. So if you buy a cow as an investment uh, and the legal system falls apart, you can still drink milk and make cheese. Um, but if you're legally backed power to enforce a contract or collect a debt falls apart, uh, you have nothing except your, you know, unless you have other, other ways of persuading the person who owes you, uh, you don't really have uh, much at all. So abstract property needs better protection. Uh, and, and here you can think about what kinds of, how clumsy old forms of protection, right? So if you, if you wanted to make a very big loan in the Middle Ages, uh, what did you do to take collateral? You took a hostage, yeah. uh, which is really expensive and cumbersome and uh, uh, you know, not, not, a, not a fun system. So, so you, the, the centrality of, of, uh, of having some kind of legal backing for, for your abstract obligations is really crucial. Now, it turns out that for the last 40 years, this, this dynamic of trying to gain uh, better legal protection is um, more and more important. And this is not only because abstract assets are a larger portion of total wealth. It's in part because of that, but also because of the transnational element with the ability to choose your locale at the press of a button. Um, so this is also an old dynamic. Uh, in the 18th century, people already realized that, that if you had assets, if you had paper assets, you could move around and you could escape, uh, you could escape you know, royal authority uh, better, than if you, uh, better than if you had land. Um, but, uh, but I think now it's a dynamic that's on steroids. So uh, states compete to attract business just as they compete. The, so just as they have tax competition, they compete regarding legal rules and legal enforcement, uh, not just with each other, but also with for-profit arbitrators. So what we see here, and this is, this is, this is where the three of you, I think, come, come together, um, is that actually three of the most basic aspects of sovereignty uh, are, for the past 40 years, maybe a little longer, under greater and greater challenge. Uh, so three different things. One is the claim to be the ultimate enforcer of, of legal norms, uh, because the parties can choose, pick and choose their legal norms. The second is the prerogative to tax, because strong parties can choose their domicile for tax purposes. And third, the sole right to mint money, because as shadow banking or the euro dollar market indicate, uh, state banking regulation lets actually a great deal of money creation go on beyond, beyond the ambit of its, uh, of its clear institutional frame. So now in those, in those terms, this begins to look a lot like, like Anusha's, Anusha's claim, right? Sovereignty isn't simply uh, unchallenged coercive power. Uh, it's power, and power always meets with resistance, almost by definition. Um, it's often, if not always, negotiated. Sometimes the ostensible monopoly on violence is not the most important, certainly not the sole factor in what people will actually do. Um, but 
so so there's a commonality there in the in this in the thinking, but I think that in other ways, Katerina and, and, and Anusha are more at odds than in agreement. So highlighting the idea that uh, that coercion isn't uh, isn't enough seems uh, necessary. But the jump to the conclusion that any resistance to pure state action uh, translates into democracy seems to be an aspirational idea, but not one that uh, does a lot of work. For, at least, at least with the word uh, with the word democracy as as, as people use use it in a in a normative sense. Um, now, Katerina, on the other hand, suggests that when private actors act to change the code, they're actually often undermining democracy. Um, there, there is sort of a sharing of power in a system where the authority holder has to negotiate a settlement with those from whom uh, she expects to tax, or more directly, those with whom uh, she intends to, with those that she uh, you know, wants to have her money taken by in spending. Um, but there's no sense in which that, that bargain must Right? There's no necessity for that bargain to be a democratic bargain. Uh, so I, I think in general, what happens is the, the negotiation over the shape of that bargain is, is dominated by, um, by people who have resources. Uh, certainly in the, in the story that Katerina tells, it's dominated by, by players with a lot of market power and people who are, who are rent seeking. Right, there are concentrated interests uh, that today I think uh, it, it would be odd to, to consider them as, as democratic interests. Um, okay. Um, this this raises another issue about what the extent to which the state is like any other party. Um, so Anush says it, that, uh, that the state is seeking uh, a form of, of liquidity. Um, that is, in a sense, he always sees it even when it's spending as a borrower. Um, but if that's true, I think that it's, that, uh, it's not borrowing funds at that point. Right? It's borrowing in the sense right? when the when the state spends, it's taking it, it's taking some other kind of consideration. Right? The government spends by taking goods and services in return for its money, not by borrowing money. Though. So the, so the government can do two different things. It can borrow money or it can spend money. Uh, both could be seen as taking on obligation, but they're not exactly the same. So the government does need to generate acceptability, uh, without which it can't spend. If people won't actually uh, give it what it go, give it what it wants for money, then it won't be able to spend. Uh, that seems still different from being subject to the same liquidity constraint as other actors. Uh, now, this might seem like a, a technical point, but I don't actually think it's it's completely technical. I, I actually think that uh, it is important to see why the state is not just like another bank, and. Uh, Not only for, for the question of whether the states that we know today are actually behaving completely differently, but uh, certainly to explain lots of state action in the past. Uh, you know, the, the issuing of greenbacks is one is one great example. But um, but also to figure out what states could do. So uh, there's I don't think there's any necessity for us to imagine. Uh, a state running its money only through the model of borrowing, that is, only through the model of, of banking. Um, right? Because, because in some ways, that flattens or erases the very basic difference that, uh, that I think is actually worth holding on to in sovereignty, right? the idea that, that the state can obligate before, that is, ab initio, the state can, the state can obligate out of nothing. Um, which the banks, <laughs> I think we can say, thankfully, cannot. Um, 
Now, I think this, the, the contrast between, uh, between sort of a unified autocratic uh, sovereignty versus a dispersed market, that, if, that's the, if that's the distinction, then, then the latter, right, a dispersed market sounds like democracy. And if the only thing that you could have in the world was either a true autocrat with smallholders as clientele, uh, that might make sense. But I think in our world where sovereignty is actually fragmented, where there are excellent opportunities for capture, and where the market, or at least market forces, represent a lot of highly concentrated wealth, then the uh, equating the, the demos with the market is, is, a, is a problem. Um, OK, now two last issues. Um, and one is one draws straight from a comparison between between Katarina and, and Jami. Uh, so Katarina's emphasis is on the way that private actors uh, are really the motivating force, the driving force uh, for change. Um, and in, in Jami's pr presentation, it seems like the complete opposite is the, is the truth. Public officials, uh, at least sometimes, play a crucial role as first movers. And this came, came through in, in Chris's uh, introduction as well. Um, and it's especially true where the change at those junctures where change isn't piecemeal uh, or incremental, but rather monumental. So, general incorporation statutes, establishment of national banks, unification of monetary systems, um, uh, major shifts in the basis of currency, and maybe even bailouts. These are all instances where, where public-minded people in constitutional conventions or in legislatures or in executive positions actually take the lead in shaping fundamental market institutions. Uh, so this still accords with the idea that the legal code enjoys a kind of primacy in creating and developing capitalism, but it takes some of the edge off the claim that change is primarily driven by private rent seekers. Uh, private rent seekers seem particularly important as the anti-heroes for the last 40 years, I think. Um, but I think as a, as a general formula for, for capitalistic development, they might be, uh, might be less central. Um, but we could flip things a little bit and turn this into a question for, for Jamia's. So there are lots of things in Jamia's paper that say functionalism is, is, not, a good, is not a good theory. Uh, there are a lot of references to a lot of critical work that, that attack functionalist histories. Um, but when we get into the analysis, it seems like there's a lot of, that function or necessity is actually doing a lot of work. And, and especially the necessity of certain governance outcomes. So, uh, and, and there's a real puzzle about how open-ended uh, things are and how open-ended, uh, uh, how many of the results that you, uh, that, that Johnny finds are actually could have come out the other way, including things like the monopoly on note issue. So there, there are sentences in the piece that say, the monopoly on note issue was actually a foregone conclusion. It was part of unifying the currency. It's unimaginable that a state would have multiple uh, multiple currencies, multiple ways to pay debts, and, and I think one of the things that we see over the last 40 years is that states are actually possibly pretty loose about their monetary sovereignty. So one of the things that's happening, even in a place like the US, if you think about euro dollars, but certainly for almost all other countries in the world, is that states don't hold on to their monetary sovereignty as tightly as we might imagine, and many states actually live with, with multiple units of account. It's not unimaginable. Um, OK, so I want to I finish up, because I've taken up a lot of time. Um, and I want to sort of ask if we, if we were to put these three presentations on a map of how, pol how monetary politics works. Uh, I think for Johnny, the state leads. Uh, its governance considerations dominate. Uh, they're in, they're in hybrid relation with, with the private, although the private in your story is really the Bank of France, which is not, uh, not your typical banker um, in, in any way. I mean, 
right? This is th these are bankers who are worried about too much credit. Uh, that that should signal to everybody that they're not the typical private bankers. Um, for for Anush, states are basically market actors with a slight edge, and their limitation is uh, their limitation is sort of um, definitionally democratic. And for for Katerina, private actors dominate by writing the code of capital as part of their attempts at rent seeking. Now these seem to open out onto different horizons for change. Katerina seems very pessimistic about the past, but somehow in principle possibly optimistic because the code is constantly being rewritten. It may be hard to chase private actors, but if we tool up, maybe we'll just get better at it than, than, uh, than a lot of bankers. It's, there are certainly many more of us than there are bankers. Right? So um, that is, there's, there's certainly many more people who are not, uh, you know, who don't necessarily share the interests of the 1%. And, OK. Um, so, so in principle, there could be something, there could be something uh, optimistic about that. Um, and the, that kind of possible optimism, I think, collides with Anusha's uh, somewhat metaphysical account of, of money through capitalism, that is the capitalist money being the best money. So I'm not sure that I understood where uh, that was heading. But it seems to me that it uh, posits almost as a necessity that, uh, that states actually have to outsource money creation. Um, and, and that we actually have to have banks to consider what money really, Internationalized money. really is. So OK, so this is, this is, a, this is, a, this is a good issue for, for discussion. It just seems to me that there is, uh, it would be possible to constitute a money system, and one that I could imagine as being more democratic uh, through, um, through a system that wasn't necessarily uh, profit-oriented in its money creation, uh, money creation uh, activities. And so the, the last thing I'll say, which will take one minute, is that um, I think that one of the interesting things about these presentations together is that they show that the closer uh, we get to the core of valuation, uh, the bigger the effects, uh, the bigger the effects on our democratic lives can be, right? The, the, the reason that valorization is such an important thing is that it turns into the way we value everything else. And so writing the legal code of, of property is, is important even for cows, but it becomes much more important when the thing that we're coding about is, is the kernel of how we make value for everything else. Okay, so we have left ourselves uh, very little time for discussion, but we can have some discussion, right? Yes. Uh, okay, I was pointing behind you. Yes. I think there's a mic here. Okay. Uh, this is a question for Anoush. And uh, so you pointed out that the survival constraint of states in a fiat banking system exists, but it's weak. Yes. Um, and so the way Depends on which it state. works under the democratic sovereignty, you say is that when the state borrows, people try to share their future product. Now, I wonder whether we should replace product by money. Because there's two ways in which uh, these obligations can be adequate. Take back in the future. Right? So either people actually have to go through something in the future, or the money supply keeps rising when these obligations are not enough. In which, in which case, the survival constraint of the state is even weaker. Or at least that one, um, one aspect of it is weaker than the digital revenue. So with acceptability. Anyway, but, uh, let's let's take a, take a bunch of questions and then get back. Yes, please. Yes. yes. Um, thank you. Uh, Anush, you get into the political economy of uh, money, of accepting money. And Laura, you make the, the good point that one doesn't necessarily lead to democracy. So if we want no corruption and no forced inequality, this amount of production of money or the printing of money is inherently corrupt in that the first receivers of that money get to buy the goods in the marketplace at a discount versus the latter receivers of the money. So the latter, that you receive, the later that you receive the money, the less your purchasing power is because prices have gone up in the marketplace. You 
the scarcity of goods. So the first receivers of the money are generally the state and uh, bureaucrats in the military industrial complex to fund the war, like Dick Haynes talked about. The latter receivers of the money tend to be those who have less skills and are in the service economy and manual labor. So is that not a form of forced inequality that le then leads to a totalitarian state, held that maybe a totalitarian state with fur lined handcuffs? <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah, and so Bill, on the point that you were making about the fact that the state isn't getting money from the private sector, but getting real goods and services, to tie that to this point about taxation and the question of colonial value, it seems to me it's not this issue of periodically taking money back from individuals, but putting the public under a state of being in constant risk, if not guaranteed, monetary obligations that are imposed or enforced by the public. So whether that's court fees or the risk of hitting someone with your car when you go outside and being sued or things like that. Even if you don't have a tax bill today, the fact that you know you may be under risk of incurring monetary obligations forces you into monetary production economy, at which point the state's relationship with you is not credit to debtor, it's, it's a vendor salesperson, you're a payee and your willingness to accept their money for real goods and services means that you're willing to do whatever they want at that point. That, that isn't a Yeah, so my question is also for me. Um, I argue with people all the time about you know, the constraints on government spending. And of course, the trade is a survival constraint. And you know, we fall into something just like you know, everyone else where you just don't put money back in the toilet paper store or something like that. So you know, currency is a unique value. Um, but my question for you is how do you see, what do you see as taxation's role in uh, the government's view of its survival constraints? Right. Um, I have One in the back. So, one in the back. Yes, in the back. So maybe, maybe we'll take one, one more and, and, and then, uh, yes, please. A question for Professor Maroon. Um, it seemed like you framed it in the beginning with an interesting question of why was French capitalism um, more constrained by uh, retained earnings? And that it seemed like you were pointing in the direction of a central bank that was too 
parsimony and to credit, two tied to mentalism. But I didn't see the connection between those two. I mean, it seems it seems plausible, but I didn't I didn't see that sketched out. Okay, so um, I think what we should do is the three of you should take about ninety seconds each, <laughs> yeah. which, which, I mean, which will give yeah. two thanks. Um, <laughs> so, or maybe a little bit more, but but you're you know know that you're that you're eating into people's coffee breaks. So, so I can uh, I can do less than ninety seconds. So, that's, uh, so I'm just going to answer mostly your your question. I think what is being chipped away it's sort of a constant thing. So mostly exemptions um, to play by the general rules, even by general bankruptcy rules. So you do bankruptcy safe harbors, you do other exemptions. So the chipping away is mostly sort of to 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 sort of shift the interpretation or actually the application of certain rules, and sometimes get ex explicit ex um, exemptions. So I can't point to specific institutions out there. Um, on, on, on the value issue, um, sort of I'm thinking mostly about sort of the creation of, of wealth, monet, monetizable wealth over time. That, um, that would be my definition. Um, so just uh, picking up on that first point, and then I can just make a comment about Roy's uh, comment. Um, the, the story that I told today was, you know, was just focusing on one moment of this constraint, right? But in fact, the, the bigger context is the post-World War II when there was a very specific targeted allocation of credit to promote export-led industrialization. So what I do is I say that in the previous period, there was a history in which the Bank of France was clearly central, but there was also restrictions uh, on, in regards to uh, general banks. So there's this whole literature on whether or not the supply of credit was adequate in general in France in terms of the promotion of, of, of capital, of the concentration of capital. So this is just one part of it. And I think that the issue of the general influx of liquidity into the banking system. So provincial banks were involved in financing investment by the early 20th century, but there were still smaller banks. And so the rate of capital accumulation was also rather small compared to what happens afterwards, after the war. Um, on, on Roy, you know, do we think about governance as functionalism? And the answer is, I don't think so. I mean, I think that what was happening over here was an attempt at governance, which in fact did not really work terribly well. So it's not as though that the state had somehow foreseen the fact that you need XYZ policies in order to promote exports. And I think this comes back to the issue of sovereignty, which is the sovereignty really comes, I would say, uh, from having access to foreign exchange. And that really was not very well done until after the Second World War. So it was governance, but it was not functionalist in the sense of efficiency, if you want to think of it in that way, because it was ridden, it was riven with, with politics and the political power of the BOF. And just one final thing, which is that I think we need to be a little careful in not using bankers as some sort of a homogenous category. So in the case of France, uh, we had, there were some bankers who wanted to actually promote uh, expanded credit supply. In fact, I make that point quite clear, right? Um, but then there were, you had others, including the Bank of France, who were sort of more monetarist inclined and they were concerned about. So there was, all, there was, there was tension between the two sides. Um, so. Oh, it's on. Um, so thanks for the questions, and, and thanks, Roy, for your um, uh, very keen observations. I think you're absolutely right that the more dematerialized the value gets, the more, or the asset gets, the more you know, salient the, the legal binds are. Um, and I guess perhaps I should clarify. For me, I don't think this democratic sovereignty point is a normative point at all. It's completely a positive point. And it rests on the following claim. How do we legitimate taxes? That's, that's basically what, what now... That's, I don't see the method by which we legitimate taxation, um, namely in the name of, we rule in the name of the people, we legitimate it in the name of democratic sovereignty. I don't see that, as, as the lady uh, said, as um, a contingent political fact. That is axiomatic. We don't have, in the modern period, another ground for legitimating governance. That's not available to us. And where that exists, that's an outlier. That's clearly an outlier. Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Now, of course, contingently, that, that can be more or less of an eyewash. That can be more or less uh, hollowed out. That is deeply a matter of political contingency, right? Uh, and tax havens are precisely a hollowing out, just as so the shadow banking system is precisely a hollowing out of a kind of democratic sovereignty, absolutely, as a matter of practice. 
But no one, as a matter of legitimating claims, the, uh, makes any other statement, any other way of legitimating taxation. That is a constraint. That, that is a political constraint. They are, states are forced to legitimate their taxation in the name of democracy, in the name of a kind of, uh, of, of a demos. And that, in a sense, gives, the more it does that, in fact, the more the, it's bigger its taxation catchment area is, and therefore its ability to bend the survival constraint is, is more or less. So the f survival constraint, in a sense, acceptability, the survival constraint are the flip side of legitimacy, if you like, the banking school rendition of the idea that the old Weberian saw of the state being having the legitimate monopoly on violence. Legitimacy is not just an eye wash, right? And, and, and it becomes more or less shop worn depending on the ebb and flow of politics, but it is ax absolutely axiomatic. So I don't see that as a normative claim. Um, I see that as, uh, as a statement of, of, of how the world works and how it gives states differential power. Now, uh, so it enables the state to inhabit the logic of banking in a, in a, with, with, an, with an edge, is what it's saying. Now, um, one way, I think, to link up to what Katerina is saying is clearly there has been an effervescence uh, in, the, in the recent past of private money claims. But in terms of your list of attributes, um, one potential pinch point between the different levels of the hierarchy, public money and private money, is uh, universality and convertibility. Right? So when, you move, when we move from capital to money, we are, in a sense, moving from the asset side to the liability side. And, the, and what, what banks want to ensure, what private banks want to ensure, is that their money, which is li private liabilities of the banks, are convertible for state money. Right? And that, gives us, that, gives, that makes this big 10,000 pound gorilla that we all have, namely our state, that gives us leverage. Because the terms on which we can uh, sanctify and, and, and you know, do convertibility, which of course then leads to universality because we're not carrying around private claims in our pockets, we're carrying around state claims. That market making, if you like, the terms of that market making between private money and public money, that's a huge pinch point. And I think we could, if we can focus our efforts there and uh, change the, and so what's happened contingently is that, that a particular balance of power has configured that, those terms radically anti-democratically. But the tools are there, uh, I think, as, as, as you're saying, the tools are there to kind of, um, to render that more democratic. And the, the state has the heft to do it. So that's a good optimistic place to end our session this morning. <laughs> Thank you very much.